Hello, my name is Madeleine Schmoll and welcome to our final live tasting of 2020. In case you hadn't guessed it, this year it's all about Christmas and more importantly all about retro Christmas. So we're going to be diving into these drums with lots of memories of Christmas past, stories to make you feel a bit warm and fuzzy and plenty of good banter as well. So I'm going to take it away and introduce my co-hosts for the evening. We have our master global ambassador, John McShane. Hi, folks. Hey, John, how you doing? Not bad. We, uh, we also have uh, Lee Connor Connus, who you may also know as Connus, uh, joining us tonight. How you doing, Lee? Wonderful, Madeline. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Christmas, Excellent. nearly Christmas. <laughs> It's nearly not 2020 anymore as well, which is also good. I know. Really? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to move on from 2020 a bit. Absolutely. Um, so before we get started on the jams, um, I'm just going to run through the order of the festivities tonight. Um, so in terms of dram order, we're going to start off with the 134.7 before moving on to the 77.67, followed by 9.182, 46.99, and 16.49. All of the bottles are currently live on the secret site, which you will have um, received a link to in your email. Um, all of them are available with the exception of the, um, the 46.99, uh, which is not for sale tonight, but all of the others um, you can purchase. And uh, I think with that being said, we should get going. Nice I start, Mads? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I think that was actually my job there. I was a wee bit oh, nervous. Yeah. <laughs> you, you carry on, you carry on. Uh, so our first job of the evening is uh, 134.7. Um, and if you were active in our Facebook event group before the event, we asked which drums you were most excited to try. Um, and this drum had uh, five votes. So uh, we'll, John's going to introduce it and we'll, we'll try it and see how we get on. Great stuff. Thank you, Mads. This is a fascinating dram because several years ago, I got to know the ambassador in the UK for this particular distillery from India. And we got very friendly and I talked to him about perhaps getting hold of a cask. He talked to his the owners of the distillery back in Goa, Paul John, and he, even when they came to see him, in London, he brought them round to the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Paul John himself and a couple of the other senior people there. And we got on so well, Paul John loved what we were doing. And shortly after that, we managed to talk about getting a cask and we had 134.1 and dot two very quickly afterwards. Shelton himself, the ambassador, big SMW's member, loved to wear his lapel badge, which is what I love to see. So good on you, Shelton, if you happen to be looking. Can I just say as well, we don't know tonight how many people will be joining us from different countries. So please let us know where you're, where you're joining us from. And Mads will let me and Connors know. Because things have changed in society. Hi, I'm Marcus from Frankfurt. You know that um, way back in winter 1993, Pip Hills, our founder, wrote in the newsletter, he said... For many years now, we have had overseas members of the society, people who joined the society and maintained their membership despite the inconvenience of being resident abroad. <laughs> and at the time of writing in 1993, the society had branches that just opened in France, USA and Japan. And now we're in about 24, 25 other countries. You have your own branches, your own access to the whiskey. So it's all just fantastic. Now, one, three, four, let's see. It's a, from India, as you can guess, so the maturation period required in these hot climates is obviously much less than we have to have in Scotland. So this one at five years old will taste, if you imagine how Scotch would taste, a lot older than uh, you would normally expect, and it's 61%. So let's have a little sniff. And let us know what you're getting. Let us know what you're getting. The thing about tasting our whiskey is you can read the tasting note 
before you sniff and taste the whiskey. Or you can sniff and taste the whiskey and then read the tasting note. Second way is much more fun. Because if you read the tasting note first, you'll just be kind of inclined to look for the aromas which you've just read about. So let's have a go and see what you think. Now, I was definitely getting orange marmalade and raisins there. Slight light woodiness with some tangerines. And vanilla and honey coming through as well. So just please let us know what you what you think. Uh, Carson has got a uh, dusty leather note. Dusty rubber note. Uh, dusty leather. Leather note. Okay. Okay. Funnily enough, I think um, when I when I when I initially tasted this whiskey, I thought I got a bit of that. When the water was added, it's interesting that you're getting it neat. I presume you're still drinking it neat. Mark Lindsay says Brazil nut toffee and we have N and J Frankfurt saying overripe apples. Oh good. Nadja and Jens, good to hear from you. John, I'm just yeah. seeing I'm just seeing here, mate, it's at a, a whopping sixty one point one percent. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm I'm not getting any real big alcohol attack. I mean it's there, but on the palate it's I know it's incredible. It's, incredible. It's, it's amazing sometimes you get an alcohol which is that kind of strength or maybe top fifties and it's still very much as if you wouldn't think it carried that much alcohol. And then mm -hmm. some whiskies which are much a much lower alcohol level actually you feel as if water is definitely required there. It's just one of those things, you know, depends on the maturation, the new make spirit. I was definitely getting a bit of pim on Pim's like aroma from mm. this. Yeah, forest fruits definitely for me. <laughs> By the way, folks, this is my friend. This is Jock. Okay. Now, Jock, I offered him, look at this, some Louis Rodera 2009 crystal. But he says, no, thank you. I'll stick with my Lafroig. <laughs> <laughs> and he's even, look got at that. Good taste. And, he, and he's even got his Scotch Malt Whiskey Society watch on. Do you Amazing. That? One, of, one of our first members, Jock. <laughs> I've heard many stories about that particular watch, John. It's, <laughs> that watch it's, is all around the world. It's a present to me from some of the Denmark SMWS people. Renny, Renny Larson gave it to me. Um, <laughs> that does sound dangerous. Yes, it can be. I mean, always drink responsibly. This this stuff's for sitting, not building. Always remember that. Yes. And also, uh, for those of you tuning in, um, I've noticed we've got a lot of people from Germany, Scotland, Luxembourg, Netherlands, and uh, and the UK. So just quite quite a wide audience tonight. And this is a pairing. We we'll try to pair these drums, folks, and we try to pair this one with mince pie and whiskey creme. Okay, so I'm tucking in here to see how it goes. Yeah. You can't beat a mince pie at this time of year. Mm. Hmm. I'm not usually partial to mince pies, but whiskey cream, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Happy days, John. Oh, that's wonderful. A great pairing. So at home, <laughs> folks, if you want to make yourself some whisk some mince pie whiskey cream, that's a great pairing there. Do you know, John? I think you could actually uh, you could you could use this whiskey if you were making your own mince pies. Um, we shared a recipe on on Instagram. I think it was last week um, okay. for crumbs. Uh, so I'll share that again in the next uh, couple of days in the event group. But definitely give it a go. What's very interesting about this distillery, Mads, as well, Connors, is that they're very much focused on flavour as opposed to yield. 
Hmm. Many distilleries around the world, it's been said in the last generation that they've tried to change the barley type to just increase the yield of the alcohol. Uh, and some people say that that's been at a loss of flavour. It's very, it's very debatable, that. Mm -hmm. But this distillery is certainly focused on the flavour. They're still using barley, which doesn't necessarily give them a big yield. Yeah, it's, it's six row barley or something like that. It's, it's really oily. And, you know, yeah. I think they, they need a bit of robustness in the spirit because they're going to be maturing it in India where it's hot. Yes. Um, a, a little bit like Gate said, but not too much like Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> from Goa to Gateshead, from Goa to Gateshead, that sounds like the name for the next whiskey, Chorus. It, it does. It sounds like a bottling name, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that well, yeah over to the, the temperature difference does make it a difference in maturation. <laughs> and up, I mean, when we go on to the next one, we'll see that. I mean, um, obviously we've got one three four seven here. It's only five years old, but it's taking on a fair bit of colour there. Whereas the next one, it's eleven years old and it's still paler in colour. You know that makes a difference. Mm. Yeah. So, what do we Dude. think of that one, then, folks? I, th I think it's great. I mean, I, I'm gonna. Uh, I'll take some comments here in a minute. But um, sweet, fruity, and mellow. In addition to being really good with mince pies, um, this flavor profile works really well with mulled wine. So, if you just if you have some mulled wine, pour a glug of this flavor profile in, and it it's really nice, actually. Yeah. What's very interesting, actually, about drinking, for people who are new to our society, or perhaps new to drinking single cast whiskey, is that there are two types of tasting notes. There's a direct tasting notes where you just identify the, the aromas, whether they are fruity or nutty or meaty or whatever, just develop it from there. But sometimes uh, whiskey can actually take you to a place and remind you of a special moment. And we had a chairman of the society a few years ago called Willie Phillips. And Willie was previously the chairman at McCarran. He came to us, he was our chairman for a while, and I believe he's now mm -hmm. at Argowan, the new distillery. But Willie tells a story about when he was camping as a teenager. When they were camping on a beach near a distillery on Speyside, and he smelled this smell, the aroma from the distillery the whole weekend they were camping. And even now, decades, a generation later, whenever he smells that whiskey, he can tell immediately what it is, even if he's given it blind. It's just fantastic. And there are other, other things that can happen you know, that can take you back. I mean, for example, we are celebrating Christmas here. But in Scotland, we can't say that we're not celebrating Hogmanay as well. When I was a very young kid, Christmas Day wasn't even a holiday in Scotland. Hug me, knee. my father used to go to work on Christmas Day, way back in the, when I was very, very young, pleased to say. Uh, but, but, but obviously just changing, the Christmas Day became a holiday, sort of late 50s, early 60s. But you don't change a generation's thoughts overnight. So my family's gathering was always in Hug me, knee, my grandmother's house. We even opened up our Christmas presents in the evening before this, the festivities started at midnight. So I'm uh, drinking to Hogmanay as well tonight, as I'm sure many of you Scots will be doing. Ah, uh, yeah. Cheers to that. Absolutely. Yes, to you, John. Mm. Just to pick up a, a few comments that have come in in the meantime, some of you are saying um, that you've not had the link through for tonight's tasting. Um, the German tasting is actually this uh, Saturday, I believe, at uh, at 6 p.m. Um, so the, the email um, is likely still coming to you with the link for that. Um, but in terms of flavors, let's uh, go back to the whiskey. So Karst, <laughs> uh, it's quite a creamy, sticky, sweet dram. Uh, Harry Gale says it doesn't need water. Um, and Andrew Gibb says that there's flavour in here that he can't quite put his finger on, um, but he's never tasted it before. So hopefully that's a good thing, Andrew. Um, and I think with that, uh, it's a really good time to move on to the next jam, which is 77.67. Um, and Connors, I think you're you're going to take that one. Absolutely, yeah. Well, 77.67. Um, now, we've named this one esoteric gibberish 
and I'm hoping they haven't given it to me to present for a reason. <laughs> I guess we'll probably find out in a second. Um, but 77, um, it's one of my go-tos. And I'm the kind of brand ambassador who doesn't like telling people his go-to whiskeys because they'll sell out. <laughs> but it's Christmas, so I'm allowing myself this time around. Now, um, tried all these earlier. Now, as I mentioned briefly um, before there, with regards to the maturation, this has had 11 years in uh, ex bourbon uh, and the last one uh, which was the Indian whiskey you can't really see it too well there here's India here's Scotland you can see it's just a little bit lighter in color even though it's spent longer in the York and like I said that's all down to the temperature and when it comes to nose and whiskey obviously everything that we put together is going to be a cask strength that doesn't necessarily give you an exact um, kind of idea of you know how much of an attack is going to be in the whiskey. You just got to approach it with a little bit of caution at first, and then once you're used to it, that's great. Now, with this one, I actually tasted it earlier, and it's a, a one of those drums where you can kind of pick out the different parts of the process right from the glass. There, you know, I'm getting a little bit. Beeswax, a little bit of sort of cheesecloth type kind of sweet sour thing going on. And we'll just have a look on the palette there. And for me, all of a sudden, it's a little bit more fruity. We've got kind of pineapple, mango, sort of tropical fruits going on. Um, ginger spice, maybe even a little bit of lemon sherbet in there. And what John was saying earlier about um you know being reminded of different things from smelling smelling something or tasting something my particular one that always triggers me is white pepper it always makes me think of my grandma's house and i didn't know why until sort of relatively recently i was talking to my uncle and he said the reason white pepper reminds me of your, of your grandma's house it's because your granddad used to coat his entire meal with white pepper, no matter what he was having. He loved this stuff. He couldn't get enough of it. And I just got a little bit of that there when I was tasting it. So when we drink, especially kind of high strength whiskey, this is what, 58.6. Um, people talk a lot about adding water to whiskey. Again, there's no rules with whiskey. Bottom line is, Bring it how you like it. What I would say is if you like it, don't do anything with it. If you don't, or if you think there's something off or it's a bit lagging somewhere, pop a little bit of water in here. Now tonight's theme, everyone, is retro gifting. Now, if you were watching myself and Mr. Stephen McConaughey the last time I was on, you may have picked up on the fact that my uh, water jug was... Um, unavailable because it smashed now the same uncle that i mentioned earlier got wind of this and he sent me something down let me see this john boy this is better than your watch <laughs> check that out oh, wow. what do you think of that if you actually you can't see it over the um over the camera but it's actually got the old um sort of signage on the front there uh Whiskey Museum. I can't make the rest of it out there. We're talking proper old school. Yeah, so I'm just going to add a couple of drops of water to my dram and see. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, Connors, a good thing to drink that with that jug. Here's a white horse. Look, this is, wow. uh, this is 70 proof, 26 and two thirds fluid ounces. <laughs> Excellent. I think, I, think, I think this is from the 70s sometime. Yeah. One of our members just walked into the London venue one day and he just bought it at an auction and he just gave it to me. Just gave Who it was that? It was Jason, <laughs> Jason Standing. Oh, Jason Standing. Uh, and I haven't, seen him for few, I haven't seen him for a few years, but I'm, I'm just trying to keep it for when I can see Jason and we can share it together. There's, yeah. there's a bit of old whiskey for you, eh? Mm. Yeah. Looks like a 70s bottle. 
Yeah, we've, yeah. we've got some uh, some good comments coming in about um, initial impressions as well. So Ian Golding said um, it's a bit like sawdust and resin. Or uh, Steve Williams smells like doing the ironing. Um, and then uh, lots of tongue tickling going on. And Russ Strand says it smells like hospital. Um, spicy and dry, not necessarily to um, to some of our members' tastes, but. Add a bit of water and see if it changes for you. I'm just getting a bit of wood shavings and even mm -hmm. some coconut and lime. I actually Definitely got sweet and sour there. chicken initially, or not chicken, but more the sweet and sour sauce with the pineapple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was kind of imagining myself um, smoking a very light Cuban panatella with this. Oh, there's a go up. <laughs> 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 yeah, we, we've been talking about pairings, haven't we, John? And um, I suggested with this one um, a, a bit of, you know, a nice slice of panettone, the, the Italian sweet roll yeah. all of the, yeah. um, the, the tutti frutti, yeah. um, what they call the, the crystallized fruits in there, mm. just to kind of oh. offset it. A bit, of, a bit of juice in there with the spice. Sure. John's going to give us the verdict on, on if it is a. Good match or not? Wonderful. It's a, it's a wonderful counterbalance to the kind of sweetness of the panettone. Mm -hmm. It brings out the spiciness a bit more, mm -hmm. you know? So it's a wonderful kind of counterbalance there. Yeah, it's very nice. That's, that's, what, yeah, that's, that's what pairing's all about. The, the, the two sort of opposite ends of the hypothesis right. is you, you've right. got to either get it to match or you've got to get it to contrast and yes that's right you know, it's, it's just playing around until you find find what works absolutely what so what do you guys think i i think um i prefer it neat but i'm about to try it with water now to just make absolutely sure i think water probably probably kills it a little bit for me personally um it it brings out more of the umami character in it, you know, the kind of more savoury mm. stuff. Um, a little bit of kind of a charred veg as well, <laughs> kind of, you know, when a, a mirepoix catches, you get a little bit of... Yeah. I think it's, um, I was getting a kind of a, like a champagne being poured on, on a neat nose, mm. you know, an effervescent yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'm still getting that in the palate, but I'm also getting a little bit of kind of sea salt coming in. And there's, there's no reason why there should be sea salt coming in in this particular distillery, you know, but uh, it certainly is very, very nice. I think everyone's kind of a bit split on this one as well. Um, I see that some folk are really preferring it neat, um, whereas Ian Golding says he added two drops of water and it took away the, the kind of peppery burn that you get. Um, so, yeah. 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 There's no right or wrong. At the end of nope. the day, you've got to drink it like you like it. That's the problem when you've only got a glass of it and you put some water in and it wastes it for you. Mm -hmm. That's why you're always better to have a bottle. <laughs> 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 then, then you can drink the rest of it. Mate. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is why John McShane is considered a legend. <laughs> <laughs> but let, but let, me tell, let me tell you this, folks, in this particular distillery, way back in the winter of 1994, Pip, our founder, wrote in the newsletter. Now, Pip always had a, a very sort of dry sense of humour, you know. And he said, the nature of capitalism, by the nature of capital, we have to charge you for the whiskey. But as from the date of this newsletter, we are going to give it away. <laughs> and the reason he was able to say that was that this distillery had asked the society to put some whiskey out to their members and get some feedback on what they thought of it. How good is that? So, so, so Pip circulated the whiskey for free and we got the feedback and fed it back to the distillery and I think that helped them develop their next expression or something. Yeah, you know, our first bottling of this was back in 1987 and it's it's not very kind of regular bottling that you see coming around because, you know, Glenn Lost, sorry, well, again, 77 is highly um, sought after by blenders. It's a top-grade blending whiskey, and 
there's relatively little that are around the tries a single malt. So we're very yeah. lucky. Got to show maltings. It does the maltings for other distilleries like Tariska. So, you know, it's a very, very comprehensive setup up there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, they were one of the few um, distilleries that have a salad in box Maltons as yes, well back, yes. back in the 60s. As it happens, John, there's a, a rather interesting article on uh, Malton in next month's um, Unfiltered, written by a dashingly handsome kid, Ted Lad. Or, or so his mum keeps telling me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> well, are, how are we feeling about moving on to the next dram? Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Sounds good to me. I've actually, well, before we do, I've actually, I've got a really nice story um, that one of our members shared, like while we're talking about retro Christmas. Um, and this this goes back uh, quite a bit. Uh, so this is from Michael uh, Bolton in Glasgow. Um, and he said that his dad, um, who got him into whiskey, um, used to cut the tasting notes out of the old outturn when it uh, still had the illustrations by Bob Dewar. Um, so he would tape them to the back of old SMWS bottles. And it was the combination of the illustrations and the poetic descriptions from the society that got him interested in drinking whiskey um, long before he was old enough to try them. Um, and his father's very proud of his four digit uh, membership number. Um, and they're both members now, which is a really nice story, I think. Fantastic. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, I could just say my I have got a three-digit membership number. Do you? I didn't know that, John. <laughs> and I, but whenever I go, whenever I do a tasting in Winchester, I'm always upstage by member number seventy-two. <laughs> 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 it comes along to the Winchester tastings. <laughs> Actually, if I remember rightly, there's a competition that Unfiltered are running to win the uh, a Bob Dewar original, isn't it? Indeed, that competition's running until the end of the month, um, so make sure that you enter. Um, it's actually open to SMWS, I can't speak tonight, SMWS members around the world, um, so anyone can enter. Um, and it, it's a really great illustration. You should also make sure you read the Whiskey Gout short story that goes along with it. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, I'm just going to take a quick question here from Ali. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a, he says it's a random question, so apologies in advance for that. Uh, there's a brand new Highland distillery at Dingwall who will have their very first bottles next year. Uh, do any of you know about this place and have you ordered? We have, it's called, uh, I'm going to butcher this name, Glenn Wivis? Wivis? Glenn Wivis, yeah. Wivis. I think it's um, actually one of our, one of our members in London has got a, uh, a bottle of Glen Wivis. It might even be before it's even three years old. So he was going to give me a little taste. I think, I think he owns a cask at the distillery. So it's, it's just it's great. So many new distilleries opening up in Scotland. And in mm. the next few years, you'll start to see them coming through um, and, and the society's numbers, you know, because we've we're, we're, we're got great relationships with some of the new guys and we're working with them all. So really interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I, oh, on your goalie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know much particularly about the distillery itself, but I know they're making a big thing about being all organic and all that kind of thing. Um, I've not really heard anything else about it, to be honest no. with you. So just keep your eyes open. It's going to be one of many, many new distilleries you're going to be seeing yeah, absolutely. from absolutely. online mm -hmm. in the next yeah. few years. I mean, one of the things we've done in society over the last 25 years or so is we've introduced whiskies from all around the world to our members. And the reason we did that is because members were asking, you know, are you ever going to do other whiskies? We want to try them. We're reading about them and we're seeing about them, you know, articles about them. So we provided those whiskies so our members can enjoy them, compare and contrast with the Scotch whiskies. But we're also working with new Scotch distilleries. So you see those coming through too. Uh, mm. we've, had a, we've had quite a few of the world whiskies in recent years uh, but obviously our main our main thing is a single casting of oak scotch and we'll see more and more of that from new studies coming through so watch this space yeah. definitely and it's it's worth mentioning that um, we've bottled from around 100 uh, different distilleries this year and there have been three new distilleries added to that um, yeah. which is a great opportunity to try all kinds of new things absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. 
and, uh, yeah, and that, 100, 170 casks have been purged this year <laughs> that's, that's a lot of whiskey it's a lot of whiskey <laughs> indeed sure absolutely well i think we'll move on to the next jam uh yeah, which uh, is the sure mads uh, yeah you carry, carry on mad sorry sorry to interrupt oh. Uh, no, I was just going to say uh, the next dram is the 9.182, which is a rustic with a spice kick. And John, I think you're introducing this one. Okay. Folks, this is absolutely behind, the story behind this distillery is fascinating. And it's fascinating because of the nature of very specific location of a distillery and how that makes a difference. There are lots of stories about how distilleries in Scotland have tried to replicate their spirit in another place. And they've used the same process, the same type of equipment, the same uh, raw materials, but they can never, ever get it to be exactly the same. And this is one. This is uh, Glen Grant in Rothes. And years ago, they built Glen Grant number two right across the road and it was meant to increase the production of Glen Grant because it was in big demand uh, particularly in it's big very big in Italy and they had a pipe running across the road <laughs> from the second one to the first one and they used to say that the the Rotters people used to sneak up in the evening or at night and get a drill through the pipe get free whiskey <laughs> <laughs> and our, our chairman our chairman of the tasting panel, Robin Lane, who a lot of you will know is a singer-songwriter and writes whiskey songs, he's actually got a song about it called Loons is Loons. Loons is a northeastern Scottish Scottish term for men, you know. And uh, apparently one of the uh, years and years ago, Major Grant brought back an orphan from Africa a young man called Bayam, and he adopted him, and he grew up, and he got a Scottish accent and all that, and he used to say the young African, loons is loons, the world over, but the Roth is loons is buggers. And that, <laughs> and that is Robin Legs. That was one of the lines in his song, it's about that. That distillery, by the way, at Glen Grant number two became Capadonic. Capadonic. So it's just another example of the mystery, the myth, and the magic behind the distillery and where it's situated and how the whiskey is made, you know. A few years ago, Robin Lang, who I just mentioned, the chain of the panel, uh, and I and a bunch of other people did a canoe trip down the Spey over five days. And Dennis Malcolm, who's the manager at Glen Grant and has been associated with that distillery his whole life. He was brought up in the grounds of the distillery where his father worked. And he invited Robin and I to stay a night at the distillery. So we did. And he said, look, you're in a suite here, beautiful suite that had been built by the Italian owners, you know. And he said, and help yourself to the, the bar in the distillery. And it had the most amazing whiskies and wines in there. And he said, help yourself. And we couldn't go too far because we're back in the canoe the following morning, you know. <laughs> it, was a, it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, time. I was going to say, John, uh, had those guys met you before or not? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you something. This, this, this is another piece of magic, really, that the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society creates. We get the same new make spirit from different distilleries and we have it in our own casks and we mature it. This this distillery, we've actually had eight different flavour profiles over the years. For <laughs> same spirit, and the way we've matured it in different types of cask, we've managed to create eight different flavour profiles. The only ones that we haven't created are the peaty ones, and that's obvious because you have to use peat to get a, get a, a peaty whiskey. And no other words, light and delicate. We even managed by maturing this in a Guyana, ex-Guyana rum cask to get an oily and coastal flavour profile for Glen Grant. That's quite incredible, you know. But this one, this one is juicy oak and vanilla. Yeah, juicy oak and vanilla. Now, as soon as I sniff this, I get a Japanese miso soup, would you believe? Oh, yeah. 
Also, it's charred oak. Charred oak. This is a first fill bourbon barrel. First fill bourbon barrel for 16 years. So you're going to get quite a lot of the first fill bourbon effect over that period of time. And so I've got a Highland toffee. Chocolate covered raspberries. Kind of flip flopping between a carpenter's workshop and the chocolate covered sweets and fruit and nuts. So let's hear what you're getting. This is great, John. It mm -hmm. really is excellent whiskey. Ben and Jay in Frankfurt are um, are getting lots of vanilla. Um, and Jamie A is also getting heavy vanilla and a hint of lemon. Um, Russ Strand says that it pairs really well with the IPA that we recommended, which was the oh, Sierra Nevada. I forgot to open my IPA. Did someone say beer? <laughs> we'll put that one to the test. Um, while you guys are pouring your beers, um, Ian Golding, fresh warm custard, and Mike Dads is getting treacle. Good. Um, so lots of sweetness there. Yeah. Now in Scotland, folks, this is called a hoff and a hoff. Okay, a beer and a whiskey. It's a it's a Scottish translation of the words a half and a half. Because when you got uh, any old my father's generation, when you bought a whiskey in a pub, you just asked for a half. So it was a that's what it was called a half. And, the, and, and some of the some of the mostly men in those days who drank it used to have a half pint of beer to go along with it. And they would drink their half of whiskey, then sip the beer, you know, and have another half of whiskey. And sometimes the half pint of beer would last them all night through about six or seven whiskeys, you know. So this is a half and a half. Excellent stuff. Uh, I'm surprised. This is one sort of, you know, Scottish trait that I'm surprised hasn't sort of taken off around the world. You know, the half and half. I think it's mm -hmm. a great medium of drinking um, and, and exploring flavour. Yeah. Generally, yeah. you know, I mean, you often hear of pairing wines and, you know, even liqueurs and things like that. But beer and whiskey, you don't hear as much, you know, no. going on with regards oh. to pairings. And yeah, it's I great that we're counting in it. Yeah, beer means we've exported almost everything else. Surprised we never exported that one. <laughs> Well, um, Ali says now that you mentioned it, he's a uh, he's getting panettone on this drum. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah, that, that panettone with the last one. Yeah, yeah, he getting panettone. That's the thing. Right? It's called overshadowing. Sometimes, if you're in a group of friends and you're actually tasting a whiskey, and someone on the opposite side of the table says a, an aroma, somebody that that just is enough to strike it off in your mind, you know. So in the tasting panel uh, in Edinburgh, we have to stay quiet for a minute or so so that everybody can get what they're getting without being influenced by somebody else so we get the mix of flavours, you know. Well, by the way, people in Germany might be interested in this. The the actual, though this is a, this is owned, this distillery is owned by that inter famous Scottish corporation, Campari. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but they say the stills, the stills of the straight side, some people call them they're like German helmets. So there you are. There you are. <laughs> I'm wondering, could you possibly make a distillery named Negroni? Would that work? Oh, of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> see what I did then? Mm. Yeah, in, yeah. Um, in the with a drop of water, I'm now getting varnished wood and furniture polish. Just going in with the water now, John. Yeah, I'm adding a bit of water as well. I'm almost low too because I liked it so much. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's the trouble, isn't it? You've only got a glass. Yeah, I find, yeah, I think it becomes a lot more wood forward when you add water to it. Um, yeah. I'm intrigued to see what it tastes like now with water, actually. Yeah, I see what you mean, the wood forward kind of short splinters. 
Yeah. Well, I'm getting white. Who was it? Connors, I'm getting you. You mentioned white pepper. I'm getting a white peppery kick now. Is that right? See what happens. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting a lot of chocolate and spice, mm. chocolate ginger biscuits, but there's a little peppery kick at the back there. Milk chocolate ginger gingerbread, yeah. Yeah. I thought that at first, but it's actually shifted to like white chocolate and pepper for me now. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's another great thing about whiskey. It just keeps changing all the time. You've got to keep mm. up with it. So it's like, what, what happened there? Next sure. thing you know, it's having some sort of uh, character change in the glass. Sometimes, yeah. I, don't know, I don't know if you do it, Connors, but sometimes, and, and the members out there might, might want to try this, and maybe some of you have, to pour two glasses of the same whiskey at the same time mm -hmm. and just push one away whilst you're enjoying the first one and then see what's happened in the glass to the second one when you come to approach that, you know, it can be fascinating sometimes. Mm. And, uh, and also, it depends a lot on your mood, what you've eaten, where you are. I had a Society 121 uh, Few months ago and i'd already drank half of the bottle during the course of the year and i had it this evening and i thought oh that's fantastic this is the best whiskey i've had this year <laughs> why, did, why didn't i think that when i was drinking it before and something had caused that mm. in my palate mm. and my main my, my brain because remember what your what your uh nose and your palate are doing they're they're only working for your brain it's your brain you're really sensing all those mm -hmm. are almost with and that's why sometimes it can remind you of a time and a place because mm -hmm. in your limbic system where your olfactory finishes up it's next to your memory and your brain mm -hmm. and every every smell you've ever smelled is lodged in there somewhere and it can be brought out you know if you just mm -hmm. work. And, it, and also the other thing is that if you are actually enjoying a whiskey and enjoying the aroma and the parrot just try and spend a couple of seconds thinking about where you are mm -hmm. and the moment, and that will help to lodge it in your long-term memory in your brain rather than your short-term. I was once uh, ridiculed, John, for um, <laughs> putting a tasting note as uh, prawn cocktail crisps in Gateshead Leisure Centre changing rooms in 1983. <laughs> I, I don't understand why anybody would think that was strange. <laughs> <laughs> it's very specific. It's a very specific memory. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly not. A, it's not a note that anybody else would get, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. It was a popular legend, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Nadja and Jens are saying the time the nose gets more complex. Absolutely, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that certainly as we're making our way through the drums tonight, don't feel that you need to finish each one at the time that we're uh, trying it. Let them sit in the glass a while, come back to them, enjoy them in a different order, um, and they'll change over the next um, hours. And it's always great fun to do that as well. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I've deliberately only poured half of my sample bottle. So to come back later. Uh, Nick, you know, Nick. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Lee. <laughs> well, the reason I only poured half is because Mr. McShane is a bad influence on me. <laughs> He's blaming me. He's blaming me. <laughs> uh, let, let, let me tell you, folks out there. Obviously, in Scotland, you'll know this, but uh, we are we are uh, Connors comes from the northeast of England. It's just below the Scottish border a little bit, you know, and we call the people from that part of the world Geordies. Geordies. And I say to Connors that he's just a, a jock who didn't walk far enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, John, because some of the Londoners say you're just a Scotsman with your head kicked in. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, trying to be, I'm trying to be kinder, Connors. I'm trying to be kinder. That's because you're not a Londoner. Sorry. I'm not from London. <laughs> well, definitely not I tell you another good story, folks. You may not know this, but the town of Berwick on Tweed is also just across the border. And during the wars of independence between Scotland and England, Berwick changed hands between the Scotland and England about 13 times. So when it came to the Crimean War and Queen Victoria was declaring war on Russia, she declared war on behalf of uh, the United Kingdom and its territories and Berwick on Tweed. Right? 
because it was so un, it was so uncertain where Berwick actually was country it was attaching to. So when the peace treaty was signed, Queen Victoria signed it on behalf of United Kingdom and its territories. So technically, Berwick and Tweed was still at war with Russia. That's absolutely and, true. Yeah. And in 1966, in a big ceremony on the town square, the Russian ambassador. And the town mayor for Berwick signed a peace treaty. That's absolutely true. Uh, another interesting fact about Berwick, John, is uh, whenever they want to toast something, um, you know, just generally, you know, say a slang or whatever, and they haven't got anything in particular that they want to toast, they just say, uh, to the successful, to the successful siege on Berwick, because there's not many of them. It was about to be an anniversary, wasn't it? <laughs> and also, they've got a football team in the town, but it actually plays in the Scottish leagues. So, yeah. yeah, I remember seeing uh, Berwick play Rangers once. That was oh crazy. my goodness, that was in that mm -hmm. famous game, Connor. You're too young, too, too young for that. 1967. Yeah, yeah. 1967. Or was it Celtic? It might have been Celtic. 1967. <laughs> I, I was definitely there. Well, 1967, Berwick Rangers, who mm -hmm. were like down in the lowest division in Scotland, put Glasgow Rangers out of the Scottish Cup 1-0 at Berwick. To be fair, it's, it's, an, it's a really intimidating place, Berwick. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, just taking it back to the whiskey, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Lee, someone uh, liked your tasting note. Uh, it's Nick Keane. He said that he's a fan of notes like 1960s pub carpet, which I think all of us can can probably visualise more or less. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and Anne Bingham, uh, I love the way whiskey evokes memories, um, which is uh, hello, true. And I think with that, it, it would be a really great time to, to move on to our next drama yeah, of the evening. Just, just, just one thing I'd say, Anne, who you just mentioned, Anne Bingham, wrote an article for us in Unfiltered earlier this year, where she was saying how her experience as a member of the Whiskies over the years had actually helped her understand and whiskey and the, the memories it can create and all that. Wonderful article it was too. And you can still read it. Um, all of Unfiltered is online. Um, yeah. So if you haven't read that article, please do go online and read it. It's a really good read. Absolutely. And uh, and with that, let's move on to the 46.99, the three chocolatiers. Um, I have to say, of all the votes we received in the Facebook event, uh, this one got the highest with six votes. So I'm intrigued uh, to see if it, it measures up to to your votes. As am I, Marvin, as am I. Look, um, <laughs> <laughs> I should start by saying that I uh, once trained to be a chocolatier, but I got thrown off the course because I couldn't, <laughs> because I couldn't control my temper. Oh, you I see what, what you did there. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 46.99, you've all got the uh, information there. It's 27-year-old, uh, Percival PX Hogshead. Now, I tried this earlier, and I was just about to start writing things down, you know, just to remind myself. But I decided there's not really much need because, well, I don't have enough words, frankly. Um, you go in, and it's kind of wood forward slightly, but then all of a sudden there's, there's berries, there's raisins, plum pudding, uh, maybe even some red currants in there, stewed fruits, apples, pears from the orchard. And it just keeps showing itself to you. So just take some time. And a nice little tip, actually, when you're nosing whiskey is to keep your mouth open. Because what you'll notice is, obviously, the, the, the sort of scent receptors, if you like, are in the back of your nasal uh, cavity there. And they kind of feed through in your actual palate there. So you will notice being able to smell and possibly even taste a little bit as well. Mm. It's this, just, is just, this is just one of these corners. You're just... I mean, we always say in a society, you know, always try it neat and then try a little bit of water. And this is one of those you're just terrified. Yeah. <laughs> you, put yeah. A, you put a little bit of water in, aren't you? Because I mean, it's only 52.8%. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's just, 
you know, it, it just keeps on giving just with the nose. I could sit and smell this for hours. Oh, yeah, yeah, I could too. I could, I could too. I mean, I'm getting getting burnt, burnt caramel and fruit mm. roll. And chocolate covered raisins there from Jamie. Mm. Absolutely. Big tap. Certainly, yeah. Yeah. Bourbon biscuits, prunes, Christmas, Christmas pudding. Christmas. Yeah. So, may as well have a little taste there. Yes, to you. Alison's asking if anyone else is getting uh, dark chocolate ginger biscuits. Yes. Tell you in a minute. Absolutely. Yep. Now, this thing just sets the whole palate alight. It fills your whole mouth with flavour, not just your tongue. Well, I've just put it down there and it tastes kind of candied orange peel. And then there's all kinds of things going on. And that's after even, you know, that's before I've even tried to describe what it tastes like in the palate to you. So I'm going to have to have another go, I'm afraid. I mean, it's a man getting a lot of orange liqueur, Connors. Mm. Mm. Very, very rich and velvety kind of. It's so luxurious. It's kind of like, like you said, it's 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 extravagance for the palate is what I would call it. But we could go on here. Yeah, there's there's a nuttiness to it. There's some walnut in there. The spice is just kind of coming round afterwards and warm in your palate, mm -hmm. and it's staying there forever. It's 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 taking yeah, up, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gonna have squatters right on my tongue at this rate. I would say you what though, it's not a, it's not a whiskey for sitting kind of enjoying right through an evening, is it? This is a, this is to be savoured, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe one yeah. or two. Yeah, it's, it's an after dinner. <laughs> I've actually, after got, dinner I've actually got a Pedro Jimenez port here mm -hmm. to taste long oh, later. Nice. Absolutely, yeah. You were saying earlier, we're looking forward to pairing that with some sherry. Wooden floor in a school gym after they'd been polished, then strewed food. Excellent stuff. Yes, fantastic, fantastic. Yes. I mean, I think, I think when, you, when you've tasted this Pedro Jimenez and then you go back to the whiskey, you can just sense where some of those flavours have come from. It's 27, uh, nine, 27. 27 years old, yep. Uh, distilled <laughs> on the 16th of September, 1992. Yeah. These, these these distillery dates, by the way, the date of distillation is always important. We haven't mentioned it tonight, but I always usually mention them because sometimes it can just mean something to someone in their personal life that date, you know, which gives them a thrill to the whiskey. Absolutely. Well, also, I'm, I'm, I'm going to share this with you guys because I'm a little bit disappointed. When we were talking about putting this this tasting together and the theme about retro Christmas and all that kind of thing. My big idea was to have a Morgan and Wise tribute evening, you know, like a Christmas <laughs> special. But apparently, if I make too many jokes about, you know, John shot by hairy legs or something, it's considered, you know, bullying in the workplace. So we're not allowed to do that. And I would never do that to you, John, because you're too wonderful. <laughs> but actually, John, what do you think so far? <laughs> Rubbish! Rubbish! <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, Corey, say, I know you're joking about it, but when you think back to some of the stuff that these old comedians used to get away with, mm. you know, Benny Hill and the like, yeah. I mean, you just, you just can't get away with it now, you know? Well, it's a different world and I hope a better world as well. Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, yes, absolutely. It's... Uh... All together, more inclusive. This is fantastic. I tell you what, if you've got any of this 46 at home, I know it's gone now, but some of you may have bought a bottle. Get some Pedro Jimenez and try it alongside. That's just fantastic. Yeah, well, we kept a lot back um, so we could use it on this tasting. It was, mm. You know, it, we're all about sharing at the end of the day. We're a club. It's a, a shared experience. So we're trying to get, you know, as much of the whiskey to as many people as we can, as often as we can. Uh, it's not an easy balance to strike, but we're doing okay this evening, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> hey, well, Connor, there's so something interesting about this distillery because some people, some people say, get the impression, maybe some new members that we are newish members that we 
have started the extra maturation program in the last few years. You know, yeah. somebody started in the last few years. And it's just not true. 46.9, this distillery is number nine, was one of the first re-racks 21 years ago. It came, in it came in front of a tasting panel, and the tasting panel said, you know, that's not good enough. You need to send that away. You need to do something with it. And we took it away, and we matured it in a port pipe for two years, and it came back to the tasting panel. And they then said, no, that's sublime. Mm -hmm. So it just shows the importance of that tasting panel and trying to make sure that before we bottle the whiskey for members, it's... No, yes. Yeah, and at the end of the day, nobody does it like us, John. You know, I mean, well, that's right. generally speaking, um, uh, if you look across the industry, other people who might choose to bottle their own whiskey, it's usually a couple of guys with a sample in a in an office somewhere talking about right. it, and if they like it, it goes in. We've got a you know a team of 20-odd people who it's got to satisfy before it gets into the bottle. You know, it's, yes, that's it's right. a very special thing. It, yeah. You know, some of the names on there as well are quite... You know, impressive to read too. Ah, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, we've we've had some comments as well about this bottling, about it not being available. Apologies, there. I was having some technical dif difficulties. <laughs> it's clearly not my night. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to point out this is the one bottle of the evening that is not available in the online shop um, so we were lucky enough to be able to share this with 500 members um, it's part of this month's tasting pack and I believe it's also in the advent calendar potentially uh, I think it's the last one that's in the advent calendar I oh. a, a distillery <laughs> which we've attended to a lot of our bottlings from this distillery have been aged over 20 years because we think it's well in long-term aging, as we found, you know. Mm -hmm. Around 50% of the last bottling over recent years have been uh, over over 20 years old, you know. So it's, mm -hmm. always a, it's a good one to look out for, for future bottlings. And, you know, I was reading up on this today as well. There's a, um, a few interesting facts about the distillery. One of them being it was one of the first cement buildings in Speyside. <laughs> I don't know if that started a trend, John. I've not been there long enough. <laughs> I've not been there often enough. Uh, apparently, there used to be a, a fire station house there as well, a horse-drawn fire engine. Horse-drawn was... fire engine, and it put out a fire in a distillery in 1929. Wow. It's, not, it's, not, it's no longer operating, but I believe it's still there for people to kind of look at and take photographs of and stuff, you know? Ian... We need a bottle called all the right notes, but not necessarily in the right order. All the right tasting notes. But not yeah. <laughs> that was, that's great stuff. Well, um, this is this is another one that we've, we've eight flavour profiles for. Mm. And the only ones that were missing are peat for the obvious reason and oily and coastal in this one, but we've covered all of the other uh, flavour profiles via our maturation programme at our warehouse in Glasgow hmm. and I think it's it's a delightful dram I'm glad we've gotten to share this one with so many members because um, it really is a special one and it's very Christmassy indeed yeah it is it's such a treat mm. I'm a little bit upset that I can't buy a bottle as well <laughs> me too <laughs> don't worry there'll, there'll, be, there'll be another one coming soon Carl. absolutely there's always absolutely. another SMWS bottling around the corner Absolutely. There That's is. what we're here for. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and we were talking, John, we did say that, um, you know, you could pair this with a sherry. But somebody did mention in the run-up to this that maybe a, a sort of sharing platter with different charcuterie, maybe some meats and some cheese. Yeah, something yeah. as complex as this, and if you have enough of it, you can kind of just pick and choose and experiment, and it'll go with absolutely anything. It's just absolutely. Absolutely. Marvellous. Well, while we're talking about this this kind of lead up to Christmas with all these Christmassy drams, um, I think it's a really good time uh, to to bring on James Freeman, who's our executive chef. Um, he has actually done a, a video about um, how to get the most out of Christmas in terms of cooking, which means actually spending less time in the kitchen on Christmas Day. Uh, so we're going to watch that now and see what tips he has.
roast potatoes can be blanched, uh, made ready. You can even, for an absolutely perfect result, we freeze our roast potatoes at the point where they've been boiled and shaken so that they're fluffy. Then we'll lay them out flat and freeze them. Um, and then just roast them off uh, when we need them. Basically, on the day, if you've done your roast potatoes, say roast your parsnips, your carrots, they can all be chilled down. You take your Brussels sprouts, blanch them off. Don't bother scoring them. Just blanch them off, put them in ice water when they're ready. Cut them in half. The last minute, you can saute them off. So basically, on, on the day of actually cooking, if it's a turkey that you're doing, uh, you know, you just spend your time concentrating on that and making the gravy. I would say make some stock beforehand, the day before, or even the day before. You can do a lot of this days and days before. Don't try and do it all on the day. Uh, that, I think that's the, the main thing. The other thing I would say is don't worry too much about complicated starters. You know, get some nice smoked salmon or make a whiskey cured salmon. Just something nice and light, um, you know, like a whiskey cured salmon and creme fraiche with horseradish. Or, you know, keep things nice and simple for your starters. Don't go mad with sort of canopies and, and things. Just do like nice smoked salmon or nice ham, or like nice pata negra ham or something. And just don't try and do too much. Nobody needs, you know, when you get having a nice big meal with lots of sides then. uh you don't need loads of starters and canapes and, and stuff like that. A nice yeah. cheese board at the end is always a good tip. It's uh, not too much work. Make sure you bring your cheese up to uh, room temperature. And, you know, then people can fill themselves up with things like that at the end of the meal if they really need to. It's great okay. to do with whiskey as well. Nice, nice sort of uh, island whiskey. I'm sure you guys could uh, elaborate further, but cheese yeah. really, really nicely with whiskey, especially with something sweet like, uh, you know, yeah. a quince jam or an onion jam or like candied walnuts or something, whiskey, cheese and something sweet really goes nicely together. I was going to ask you, James, in, t in terms of working with whiskey. Yeah. Any, any tips on, on actually cooking with whiskey or do you think it's better to kind of pair the whiskey? As, as no, a, I think, as I think cooking, with whiskey, whiskey. cooking with whiskey is great as long as you're, you're reasonably circumspect about it. I mean, I've given a recipe for whiskey cured salmon numerous oh. times. And I think that's really great. But but moving on, turkey is a little bit more difficult. I, I was kind of trying to sort of imagine a whiskey that I would use to cook with that. It's a bit more difficult. But say if you were doing like a, a joint of beef or a you know a piece of venison, a haunch of venison or something, and that's really easy. You make a nice gravy with sort of – personally, I would use like white wine and brandy as the base and boil that down rather than using whiskey and, and boiling that down. And then you just add a little bit of whiskey at the, at the end of the gravy making. So – with beef or venison, we were sort of looking at this earlier on, and uh, could use something, you know, like something sort of sweet and spicy. Uh, I did write something down here. Uh, let me just find that. Um, yeah, I think uh, Jeremy, Jeremy behind the bar, he he's he, he was recommending a Glenlivet. I think that's a two point one one. Yeah, yeah. Spicy sweet. Um, Got a whiskey. Good recommendation. Uh, be really nice with venison or joint of beef. With a cured salmon, uh, sort of looking in the space sides sort of uh, 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 um, sort of area. The other thing we were thinking about is I quite like at Christmas. I don't really do it any other time, but it's like a prawn cocktail or something. And instead of using the brandy in the Mary Rose sauce, if you use something like a, a sort of Klein Leash, which is sort of Got that sort of maritimey, seasidey sort of flavor. Um, so yeah, I think it just as long as you're reasonably circumspect with the whiskey and not not firing it all over everything, then uh, then it, it, it can be really really nice. Well, there you have it. Get ready for Christmas. Um, yeah. Did you make that one, John? Yeah, my wife made it for me earlier. Ah, amazing. Yeah, we um, we provided a recipe for uh, James's whiskey cured salmon. Um, so please, um, if, if you like smoked salmon, give this one a go. Um, it, it only takes about 20 minutes of active cooking time, um, but it needs 48 hours roughly to prepare just in terms of curing times, um, but do try it.
Oh, I've literally got mine in the fridge as we speak. Have you? Oh, well done getting that ready in advance. <laughs> I'm professional, you know, man. Don't don't let <laughs> don't let this silly exterior fool you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think with that in mind, um, it's time to move on to the the final drama of the evening. I, I can't believe we're already here. Um, evening's just flown by. Um, and that is the uh, 16.49. Um, and John, I think I think you're going to talk about this one. Yes. <clears throat> now, folks, this is a PD whiskey, but it's not from Isla or any of, any of the other islands. This is a Highland distillery. OK. And this one was peated. It's uh, from a recharred hogshead. And it's uh, 65%. 65%, okay? So you're going to love to try this neat and then maybe with a little bit of water, okay? So, sorry, it's, uh, no, yeah, did I say 65%? It's, um, That's right, John. Yeah, 65%, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is 65%, yeah. So, so I think on the nose... You're just immediately getting peat. And I think that's that's common, I think, with some peaty whiskies. At first, the peat is quite overwhelming. And you have to give it a little bit of time for the other flavours to come through because the phenols in the peat are just so powerful. Now, there's definitely, you get definitely the earthy, slightly medicinal stuff here. Mm. And then... And then mm. The, the, then there's a kind of, a, a kind of it's so earthy, mintiness comes through, but it's starting to get sweeter, sweeter. Is smoked that, fudge a thing, John? Smoked fudge, yeah, it's a good one. I was actually thinking that as well. It was a bit like, certainly it's a bit perfumey, I think, mm -hmm. below that peat. It's like a, an earthy Chanel number no. five. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, uh, Alan says new magazines on the nose, and Karsten says horse droppings in a nice way. Karsten, I love when people say that. I do, <laughs> <it's in a laughs> nice Brilliant. Hans says peat and fish, uh, medicine and earthy sweetness. Tom oh, White yeah, yeah. smells like feet, and Mike Dowd's good feet. <laughs> I think I think I think the longer you try to sniff it, the peat starts to try and break break up. Or it starts to pick up in your olfactories, and I, I'm actually getting a little bit of iron brew coming through, which is a Scottish soft drink. Would you believe iron brew? Scot by the way, Scotland's the only country in the world where Coke is sold, and it's not the top-selling soft drink. There you are. Who's that for a fact? Iron brew is, <laughs> and also smoked ham, smoked ham, mm. chili jam. I think almost a bit of like um, baked camembert as well for me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I've just read the, the taste and notes for this one, and the first three words are are, are rather bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> Aroma greeted the panel. And I kind of understand what I try. It is a bit bonkers, but once you get under it, like you say, John, yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, well, well, it's like that with all peated. Some people just don't like peated whiskies. Mm -hmm. I think it's because of that initial whiff or taste. You know, you just got to give yourself a little bit of a chance for your olfactory well, system to break it up a bit and experience something else. And if you don't like it, you don't like peated whiskies, but you wish you did, just try it with some water mm -hmm. in it. You know. Try it in a cocktail first, and gradually you'll get your brain used to that that particular aroma and taste that peated whiskey brings. Yeah, you know what, John? I, speaking from my own personal experience, you know, back in the day, I, I couldn't stand peated whiskey myself, but I tried it with some cheese, and all of a sudden, it made sense. You know, prior to that, I just thought it was an angry Scotsman trying to tear my mouth off. I but, was, you know, <laughs> when, you, when you get some, you know, Stilton with maybe a, a slice of apple or something, and just that bit of smoke, it's like, yes, it makes Corey, sense now. Corey, that is absolutely brilliant, as because and that's the other thing I should have said actually, is that if you don't like peated whiskey, 
try it with a little bit of food and it can change it to my whether it's seafood or whether it's cheese you know mm -hmm. you'll you'll find something that makes you like it and before you before you know it you'll be able you'll, you'll be able to accept it you it's only just training your olfactory system mm -hmm. to understand what that aroma and flavor is all about really and really dark bitter chocolate with peated whiskey is is one of my faces absolutely absolutely <laughs> my my very first distillery visit ever was in 1983 to Lafroig on Isla. And you were probably just a sparkle in your father's eye, Connors. <laughs> and, and ever since that wonderful, wonderful day and that wonderful, wonderful distillery and the great people that we spent a, quite a bit of time with, I've, uh, I've never, ever been able to drink a Lafroig without it taking me right back there, you know? <laughs> Uh, and that's a, yeah. that's a big peaty medicinal whiskey, and that's mm -hmm. uh, I've always liked that right from the beginning. Yeah, it's I mean th this style of whiskey is easily the most sort of recognisable flavour profile, if you like, you know. And it's <laughs> and, like I say, it's very evocative of where it kind of lives. Yeah, excuse me, no, if you no, like. It's uh, obviously it's peated, and the peat, the peat comes from Scotland. You know that across the world, there's many many countries with peat bogs. And Scotland is 17th on the list of most peat bogs per acre in the world. That's you know? surprising. Yeah, 17th. And would you happen to know where Ireland is on that list? I don't know. I think I think Ireland's mm. why Ireland dug a lot of it up. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You know, I think they, I think they yeah. spoiled it for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Too much of a good thing, John. Uh, oh. Let's face it. We now have to think about protecting the peat as well. Yeah. So there's only a only a minuscule amount of the peat we have in Scotland gets dug up to smoke whiskey with, you know. So there's no danger in the environment, mental sense. Mm. At the moment, and when you, yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's what about nine distilleries traditionally use peat. Well, you could, uh, you yeah, could probably extrapolate and say maybe ten or eleven. But the amount of the distilleries you use. I've got actually got a little, little story. I visited this distillery a few years ago. It was on my own. And I did a wonderful tour. And after it, I got a bottle from Fill Your Own, from a cask, Fill Your Own, yeah? Mm -hmm. and, and I got labelled and all that. And the previous people in the book, they had, they had, you had to sign your book, you know, like to say you'd got a bottle of the cask. And the previous people to sign it were the Duke, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. <laughs> and, and it was their pen that was left there for other people to use. So I'd actually been on a wee tour, so I had lots of whiskey in my car. So I put it in my book, and after that I drove to England. Don't you feel? And when I when I opened my boot, we got back to England. There was a wonderful whiskey smell in that car. Oh no! The bottle of this had popped its cork. Oh no! <laughs> and there was nothing left. Oh, a nightmare. Um, it's it's heartbreaking, isn't it, John? I know, I know, I know, I know. Mm -hmm. well, let, me, let me tell you something else, folks. I mean, okay, let, let's we're, we're talking about the palate now, yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, and I think the first thing that happens with the palate is it's sweeter rather than peaty, and that maybe comes as a surprise to some folk, you know. Uh, I couldn't agree more, John. I was expecting a little bit more sort yeah, of yeah, acrid yeah. kind yeah. of action on the palate, but when when you get it in your mouth, it I think doesn't feel as much of an attack. I think there is a slightly dry, acrid finish at the back, mm. honest, you know. But, uh, um, but, but definitely getting um, the barbecued meat and... Yeah. And it's just smoked bacon I'm getting now. And yeah, and absolutely. Chorizo, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Smoky chorizo and... Yeah. Um, a bit of vanilla as well, though. And and I know um, both Andrew and Ali have both said that they've both gotten that um, in this jam. I think with peat, you sometimes conversely get very kind of heavy, smoky peaty notes and then a very sweet note that you're kind of initially like, what is that? And once you figure it out, it's so rewarding. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. That, and that's why, Mads, I'm saying to people who think they don't like peated whiskey, and I know a few. Uh, that are on this thing tonight, but you just have to kind of if you work hard at it, <laughs> don't give up. Don't give up. <laughs> That's good advice. Um, yeah, and I yeah, should jump yeah. in here and say as well that um, this bottle is the one uh, bottle this evening that's limited to one per member. 
Um, so if you want to get your hands on it, um, it's one per member only. Now, can I also, just for people enjoying the whiskey, I, hope, I don't know if there's any cat lovers out there. Uh, me, 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 John. <laughs> well, the, distillery, the distillery cat in this distillery used, was called Towser. Towser, mm -hmm. okay? And Towser is in the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, it featured on Blue Peter, talking about shows from years ago. And it's also in the Record Breakers. And it died in 1987, but they counted up the mice it caught over its lifetime in the distillery. They reckoned it was three or four a day for 24 years, and the total in the Guinness Book of Records is 28,899. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah. Oh, but, but, but this is this is another one where we can we can take the the new make spirit from uh, this and make lots of different flavor profiles through our maturation process. You know, it's quite amazing. Very versatile. Have we tried with water yet? Um, I haven't, but I'm going to. Well, I'll put a couple of bits of water in there, mm. and the uh, I was getting a kind of. Rich porridge and cream with that. Mm. Andreas says uh, that it, it's quite hard to describe. Uh, it's quite funky, kelp, kimchi, aspirin, woodburn chocolate, burning tires, silage. Um, lots of great descriptions there, oh Andreas. Goodness, Andreas. You need to be on a tasting panel. <laughs> we, actually, we actually just discovered the other week there that Whilst a human being has got five million uh, sensory things, uh, a sheep dog has got about five hundred million. So we're getting a couple of sheep dogs on a panel next year. Oh, <laughs> hadn't heard we, about that one. We could do the we could do with the sheep dogs to round us up on the stuff night out. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> But, th but I think in the end of this dram, is, uh, I think by the time you've had a little bit of water, by the time you've sipped it mm -hmm. and all that, I think the peatiness has is, is become secondary. And mm -hmm. I think the, the sweetness and spiciness, you know, to it. You, you know, something, John, that I've not done enough, and I always think to myself when, when I've had a peated whiskey, I've not experimented enough with Indian cooking and peated whiskey. So I yeah. think there's a potential for huge kind of, you know, offsets, you know, the coconut based curries with peated mm. whiskey on it. And even when you think of cannabis, like, I don't know, an onion, onion bhaji or whatever, or even poppadoms with dips. With yeah, dips, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know. Might be a, a good one to try with all those turkey leftovers. I hear turkey curry is quite good. I've not tried it because I never have enough turkey left over. Uh, but one of these days, I will try it, and I will try it with peated whiskey, and I will report back. The trouble is, Mike, everybody's going to have a lot of turkey left over this year, haven't they? Mm, yeah. these big turkeys, and they're going to be on their own, their own a lot of, <laughs> of the country. Well, there you have it, turkey curry. We might all try it this year, maybe yeah, yeah, an opportunity yeah, yeah. to do so. Um, <laughs> But we're, uh, we're going to start to wrap the evening up a bit um, now. So it'd be really good to know um, what your favorite drums were this evening. Um, I'm just curious, because based on the votes originally, it was definitely the 46.99. Um, but I'm curious to see if that's changed. Um, so go ahead and, and send that on in the comments um, and we'll see what the result is. And Michael, Michael's what? saying I should be introduced to Shilton here. Um, oh, love to, love to. Shilton is a very good friend of mine, Michael. I'm oh, well yeah. aware of his work. He, he's an exceptional individual, and um, I'm pretty sure there's about six different Shiltons at different points of the planet at one time. The amount of work he does, it seems like he's yeah, all yeah, over the place. You know who he's named for, Connors? No. The goalkeeper. Is that right? Yes. Oh, and, I, and, I, and, I've, and I've always got a photograph. Uh, of Shelton Edinburgh with a kilt on. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that, SMWS badge. <laughs> does not surprise <laughs> me at all. <laughs> He's a great guy, Shelton. Yes, yes. 
Well, I have to say it's it seems pretty unequivocally clear that uh, the last two were the highlights. So the 46.99 um, and the, the 16.49. Um, which, you know, it actually, it ties in with a, a poll we did on social media earlier this week where we asked whether you preferred Pete or Sherry. And uh, the answer more co most commonly was that we got a private message saying both. No. So clearly, <laughs> clearly both are very popular. Um, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's a great time of year to try these whiskies, definitely come back to them. Um, if you still got some time to enjoy them this evening. Um, and, and let us know, um, as I said, I'll post some things in the Facebook um, group event. So if you haven't followed that, follow it and, uh, and we can have, we can kind of continue the conversation there a bit, I think. Um, and yeah. and uh, we've got the bottles online and um, they're still online. So um, everything is available except for the 46.99, which is sold out. Um, and I guess the only thing to really say is, uh, We've got a lot coming up in January. So we've got a, a big Burns special uh, virtual pub. Uh, so uh, as, as Richard, our, our pub landlord was saying today, get the haggis ready. Um, that'll be on the 15th of January, which is also when the January outturn will happen. Um, so there'll be a bit more from us then. Um, in the meantime, our next uh, virtual live tasting is planned for February um, and we'll have some more details on that. Um, looking to this side of Christmas, um, our, our bottle shops and our venues are open and we'll be sharing the opening times for the venues in the next few days. So if you're near to a venue, make sure you go and see what they have um, because they've got a lot of gems. Um, and you might pick something you will really enjoy for Christmas. Um, and to just go back to all of the live sessions, live tastings, virtual pubs, um, I don't know if you'll believe it, guys, but this is our 38th live event since March. 38 events in 2020, who knew? <laughs> exactly, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that John John McShane's actually becoming a television celebrity here. He's, he's, got the, he's got the whole camera thing sorted and we might not see him again. John, John if you end up on the one show off the back of this. <laughs> well, as part of that, I think it's really important to say thank you to you guys, but also to Andrew behind the scenes, who's worked really hard to organize these virtual tastings and to everyone at um, SMWS HQ working really hard um, since March to, to try and bring more content like this um, so we can, can all experience it together. It, it may not be what we'd planned for, uh, but we hope that you've enjoyed it just the same. And I think with that, it's, uh, it's time for a toast. So Indeed. to better times ahead in 2021. I think it's, um, my, it's, um, it's a great quote from when we look back and look forward, but at the moment, all we can do is live for today, isn't it? Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt once said, yesterday is history, tomorrow's a mystery, today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. So hope you all have a fantastic coming days, folk. And I'd really like to say all the very best for New Year when it comes. <laughs> It's a tradition in Scotland that we add when it comes. Otherwise, it's because we're unlucky. Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. Slange of our. Slange to you all. Thank you very much.